During the fourth session of the ninth parliament, there was a second reading of the public, consult, uh, of the public consultations on the private voluntary organizations amendment bill HB 10 of 2021. Now, that bill, the PVO bill, which uh, might become law in the next few months or so, is going to have a serious impact on how non governmental organizations in Zimbabwe operate. The bill has already sent shivers down the spines of some NGOs. Civic society has claimed that it is meant to curtail freedoms of expression and deal decisively with the civic society which has been seen by the ruling ZANU-PF as the backbone of the opposition in this country. Now, we're going to delve deep into what the PVO bill seeks to do, what it would do, and what it would assist Zimbabwean civil society and civil space to do if it does become law. Now, this right here is the situation right now in proud partnership with COTRAD, our partners from Mashingo. Now, the message from our partners, COTRAD, is all Zimbabweans must be active in civil duties, must register to vote, and must participate in the decision-making of their country. Now, this is the situation right now with me, your host, Dara Blessed Mklanga. See you after this short break. Now, welcome back to this the situation right now here in partnership with Cotrad from Mashingo. Now, we are going to be discussing the PVO bill. And to help me discuss this topic and unpack what the PVO bill will or will not do, I am joined here by the president of the Federation of the Non Governmental Organization, Gutsen Nguni. Um, in short, it's Fongo. Thank you very much uh, for, for joining us. Beautiful. I'm also joined here by um, a lawyer and, and a friend of mine, Yasin Nari, also a consultant uh, in the civil society space. Thank you and very, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Beautiful. Um, I am also joined by an honourable member of Parliament, um, my my good friend, uh, Honourable Amauswa. Thank you very much, Honourable Amauswa, for coming through. Thank you for inviting. Beautiful. Now, I'll start with you, uh, Honorable Hamoswa, because this bill is, is on your doorstep. It's in Parliament. Yeah. And, and you, you, you've gone through the first reading. But from your perspective and from what has happened through consultation processes and having read the bill, what does it uh, have in store for the civil society if it is passed as it is? Uh, what I can say, I will base my... my comments on um, the reactions that came from the people during the, the consultations. I can say there are two broad contested views. There are some people who are saying uh, the bill is necessary and these are actually in support of um, uh, the Minister of Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs who said uh, when he was introducing the bill for the second time saying that the bill is very necessary. He actually used the word very necessary uh, to streamline the administration uh, of uh, PVOs and also ensuring that they are accountable. And they were also citing that they have to be in line with the recommendations of um, uh, the um, task force on uh, uh, financial um, action. Uh, so now because of that, they are saying the PVO seeks to make sure that there is no money laundering and also the support of uh, terrorist uh, activities. And uh, they are also trying to make sure NGOs do not meddle in politics. But there are a lot of inconsistencies with, uh, within the bill. So the con during the consultations, the people expressed, especially the civil society organizations, that uh, the bill also places a lot of uh, powers, too much powers, uh, in the hands of the, the minister, 
which will also then cause a lot of bureaucratic, uh, you know, uh, inertia that might also lead to challenges in the operations of uh, uh, NGOs and civil society organizations, and which might also breed uh, maybe corruption. So this is a, a major issue. That there's too much powers in the operations of uh, NGOs, and also saying that uh, they should not meddle in politics. They, they, the specific terms are that they should not support or oppose political parties or candidates. So now it might also be difficult to interpret, and the people during consultation say they should be uh, clear. So the people are expecting to see uh, NGOs now being put under the radar, and their operations will be uh, heavily monitored, and it might cripple their operations. But from the side of government, uh, as the minister said, he acknowledges the role played by N NGOs in uh, various communities, and he went on to say where the government is lacking in terms of resources and also technical capacity, NGOs have been seen coming in. But they are saying they should be confined to uh, programs like health, and they should not go into politics. Which for me, this is my personal view, that it shows that Zimbabwe is not politically matured to a point where they say if the NGOs then meddle in politics. But there is a, a statement which the minister also acknowledges the role of NGOs in politics, especially in supporting uh, the women. They said, for example, if the NGO or a PVO is supporting women, the only problem comes when the support being given is being given in a partisan manner. But if the support is given to everyone, is not given in a partisan manner, it, it sounds like uh, supporting political candidates might also be accepted. But that should actually be, be clarified. So the, the worry from the NGOs is that they might also be closed down. It might be that the law, if this bill comes into law as it is, we might see uh, a PVOs being uh, like forced to, you know, or being deregistered uh, because maybe they are accused of being uh, funding terrorist groups or being uh, a, a, a used as channels to fund political parties in the timing also of the bill. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. We'll come. We'll come back to the issue of timing. But um, uh, Yasin, you, you've been in the NGO, the civil uh, space in the, uh, for a very long time, and you continue to work with it. Uh, from and from a legal point of view, mm -hmm. what is your reading of this uh, PVO bill? I think even before we get to the legal perspective, pretext is everything. Um, yes, the Financial Ac Action uh, Task Force, or FATF, um, under Recommendation 8, encouraged the government to put in place measures to curb terrorist um, uh, funding or money laundering. Um, I'd like to add, though, that to date, there's no statistics, there's been no information available as to any um, CSO that has been found um, to be a high risk um, or that has been found participating in money laundering or terrorist financing, right? Um, the, the crux of this issue comes from the political tensions, I think, especially in terms of, um, you know, CSOs that exist between the CSOs and the government. You know, if we were in a different environment where there weren't these tensions, um, perhaps we'd be having a, a different discussion. But we have a situation where the government has on numerous occasions um, made remarks, has commented on the involvement of CSOs in political affairs. Um, the narrative has been that um, CSOs are agents of regime change. Um, so that's the sort of backdrop we're coming from. Ideally, it should be a mutual effort. CSOs and government working together to ensure the progression of a democratic um, society. As it is, there's a lot of suspicions on both ends. And, you know, if you look at um, the timing, as Honorable said, that it's coming, and the backdrop, it then leaves um, the notion of the PVO uh, amendment bill to be highly questionable. 
it appears that it's not necessarily um, it's not necessarily about FATF or the recommendations. It's more about silencing perceived voices of dissent. Because if you look at the provisions, you find that um, the registrar would be in charge of the registration and overseeing of um, the operations of trusts that would be registered in terms of the PVO amendment bill, right? That's a public office, meaning it's run by government. And with the tensions that exist, the worry is on top of the already um, technical and difficult um, requirements that have been put in place for organizations to register as trusts in the current um, PVO Act, it, it makes it very difficult. It looks like a way of weaponizing against voices of dissent, where you give the power to the government to decide who can operate, who can't, who is high risk, who isn't. And a lot of the provisions um, in the bill are very broad. It's not specific. So when you say um, NGOs um, were trying to prevent them from engaging in political activities, that's very broad. What does that mean? Because you have humanitarian um, organizations that will, or even other CSOs, that tend to everybody, you know, regardless of political parties. There are organizations, for example, that offer medical assistance. If that's somebody who the government views as a person who isn't desirable, or someone who's against the government, they could easily target them and say, listen, this person is involved in politics, regardless of the fact that they were simply, you know, giving out health care. And they'll say, well, you were giving it to ZANU-PF, or you were giving it to Triple C, whatever it is. So there's that politicization of CSOs. So I, I think for me, just understanding that background, if, if we can grasp those tensions and those suspicions on both ends, then it makes it easier to understand why there's so much noise, um, you know, a, and hostility regarding um, the bill. Now I'll come, I'll come to you, the president of the Non-Federation of, uh, of NGOs, um, Mr. Goodson Guni. What is your reading of this uh, PVO and in, in this space, do you find it to be useful for national development? Well, thank you. Um, I am of the opinion that it is, this bill is a very important piece of, uh, of legislation. But before I tell you what I think of it, I want to go back a little bit. In 1999, in, in Matabele North and Matabele South, in most of the rural areas, the people who became candidates of the MDC were people working in NGOs that, was pro that were providing uh, health privileges. So in the year 2000, in the elections there, MDC did very well in the rural areas. And they actually got, I don't know that they got a little bit or a little bit more than ZANU-PF member of seats. It was because of that. Now, we must understand that ZANU-PF is composed of politicians. If there is a political problem, they look for a political solution. Now that's what all governments in the world do. If in America you are doing something which threatens the Republicans, in the, in the, the Republicans are in government, they do something about it. They make a law to change it. In South Africa, all over the world, that's how it is. That's how it will be in Zimbabwe too. It will be, I must also go back a little bit and explain this, that not all NGOs are bad. There are some NGOs that do proper service to our people. But we have organizations, and I, I don't know if I should mention them, like Crisis Coalition. The whole basis of why they are there is to try to show the world that there is crisis in Zimbabwe. Now, that's a political decision. That kind of advocacy is a political decision. Because as a result of the advocacy of saying that there is a political crisis in Zimbabwe, Certain countries in the world have imposed sanctions on us. So you are telling Zimbabweans here that because of that, you must take a, 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 a political decision if you believe that there no, is no crisis in Zimbabwe. Then we have organizations like Zimbabwe Peace, Peace Project of Justina Mkoko. It is highly contested what the NGO comes out with. ZANU-PF says, no, these guys are politicking. 
and they are politicking and pandering to the whims of the people who sponsor them in our country to say that we want the human rights position to be falsified by them and that is how they continue to survive to get funding from people who want to remove ZANU-PF from power. So because of all that, ZANU-PF has no choice but to look for a political solution to a political problem that has been created. There are some very good non-governmental organizations which are here. But we must also understand something which is very important, that in Zimbabwe, all of a sudden, there are more NGOs than in every country in Africa. And you and, and I know there are some serious countries in Africa where there are some serious human rights abuses. In South Africa, people are murdered just because they come from Zimbabwe, they come from Mozambique. Suddenly, there is nobody funding of, uh, civil society organizations to fight against that. In fact, we hear Dudula in South Africa is sponsored by the Americans, who sponsor 65 or 70 percent of all the NGOs in Zimbabwe. The idea being, chase Zimbabwe from South Africa, they must come here to register to vote in the next election and vote against ZANU-PF. And you can't expect ZANU-PF not to react to that. They would not be politicians if they didn't do that. So, do I like the, new, the current uh, PVO uh, Amendment Act? I'm quite happy about it. I'm not happy about one thing. The PVO Act, and I will tell the minister uh, when I have a chance to see him, it creates a lot of legality, legal problems. There's going to be lots of law cases. So in fact, nothing is going to happen. It's going to change. The registrar will say, I don't recognize you. You will go to court. There are so many loopholes in it. I would have wanted a, a PVO amendment act that says, on a given date, all NGOs must apply for registration. And I am not opposed to that for the simple reason that I am not doing anything that is political. And if crisis coalition is not going to be used to arrange seminars that put that and pay the bills for people from triple C, which they do, I can tell you this for a fact, then they are the ones who should be worried. But there's an NGO that is giving health facilities to people in the rural areas, then the PF or the government has no problem with that. Only, only those NGOs that have an advocacy agenda that is in tandem with what the MDC or Triple C is trying to do are the ones that will have a problem. And like I said, we are going to lobby the minister to actually close down all NGOs first so that we separate the chaff from the good things. Those NGOs that are helping the people here have no political agenda. They are welcome to Zimbabwe and people from both sides, ZANU-PF and, and the MDC, will support them. But those that are used for regime change or that appear to be advocating for things which are false, those organizations that lie that 20 PRI people from Triple C were killed last week and they put it on the social media, we can't have people who lie like that. Amazing. Um, I want to come to you, to you Anil Bohamosko. The, these are the allegations that have come um, from uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Gutsem Guni. Uh, do you have any, any issues? Uh, as to what he has raised? Yes. Uh, firstly, uh, I can pick uh, some insinuations from uh, his uh, responses. That uh, firstly, it is interesting that he is actually agreeing with us that the bill, the main purpose, is actually for a political reason. Because number one, he actually said the people who we voted under MDC ticket in 1999. We're all working, or majority were working in the NGO sector that was in Matebele in the South. I would then say uh, there is nothing wrong, and NGOs are actually and other interest groups, even the media. They're supposed to be also training grounds for future leaders because we need Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, we need leaders who can be groomed in all sectors. If we're going to have uh, those MPs who came from the NGO sector, they were going to speak well about the, the, the civil society organizations because they would have worked with N NGOs. They know the purpose of the NGOs. And also there is also a worrying, narrow uh, definition of politics. If I think it is high time in Zimbabwe, we take the definition of politics 
uh, broadly, not to just focus on a continuous struggle for power, as uh, a Comrade Good Goodson Goni actually uh, highlighted, because it is like uh, the, the NGOs are supporting Triple C, and the, they are mentioning those political parties who have the capacity to dislodge ZANPF from power. So you find that there is a sense from ZANPF that uh, we are now about to be removed from power through democratic processes. So when you see a, a, a ruling party now trying to regulate everything, over-regulation becomes a problem because we have a lot of uh, laws which are actually, this is what actually came from uh, <coughs> the consultations where the civil society organizations were saying we have the Anti-Money Laundering Act, we have a number of laws which actually regulate the or prevent the NGOs from uh, maybe engaging in money laundering. So why are we uh, having another law, yet we have those other laws that are not being implemented? So I think it is not really true that uh, uh, crisis coalition and other like uh, the Zimbabwe Peace Pro Project, they are just pro, uh, you know, triple C. But, but are, are you not using uh, donor funds to spring yourself into power? That that is that is the 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 gist. Are you, you know, as as legislators as, as political parties, not springboarding yourself to power using donor funds? No, there is, there is no evidence that we are getting donor funding. It's, if we talk of triple C, they, it, it, it doesn't have funds right now. If we, you go to my constituents, I will give you an example. The, 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 the NGOs that are now there, including international NGOs, they are actually controlled by government. I've written to several, uh, you know, NGOs for professional reasons. I could not tell you which ones, but I've engaged a lot of them to say we need water in Warren Park. They could not respond because they will tell you this is not the area we are operating. They are told the areas to operate by the government. And he, you, you see, uh, uh, Mr. Goodson Goon said they will prefer those NGOs which support people in the rural areas, which means that they are dividing the country to say rural areas is maybe better because it's for ZANPF. That's not true because they will be shocked that the people in the rural areas will actually maybe vote for, 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 for opposition, for triple C, because the triple C is actually making inroads in those rural areas. Mm -hmm. And also in the urban areas, we are having poverty, which is now there, which also requires the, um, the, the role of the PVOs, the civil society organizations, also to support. We have cash transfer systems that have been supported by uh, PVOs. We also have the local NGOs. Look at uh, the Joshua Ngomo Scholarship by Higher Life Foundation. They are being funded by, by Zimbabweans. There are a lot of people who are, who are actually funding uh, local-based uh, NGOs that are actually making a lot of impact. I will give you an example. There is Zela, uh, which actually trained a number of community-based organizations during the height of the indigenization program. And those who were trained, they became capacitated that they were engaging the government, you know. And in Chiadwa, they actually fought companies that were there, which actually caused the pollution of water in Save and Old River, whereby animals were actually having stillbirth. And they won the case because they were capacitated. And we have not seen them fighting government, but they are actually also capacitating the people in governance. So if we took, take politics as a governance, you know, true, we, will not, we are not going to have a problem. And there is nothing wrong by saying if ZANPF has failed, other political parties can take over. As long as they are not like, they are maintaining the interests of uh, the people. So the in, to, yeah. Yeah, I want to come to, to you, um, to you, Yasin. Uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, as NGOs, you have become the springboard of opposition polit politics in Zimbabwe. This is the allegation that you have. And it's actually written everywhere yeah. in, in, in this PVO bill. Yeah. yeah. And I think for me, that's the problem. We're politicking with, for me as a, a human rights activist, my concern really would be the role 
of NGOs. Again, I think there's not enough understanding about the role of NGOs. NGOs are watchdogs. NGOs assist the government in terms of bringing to their notice um, violations, for example, that might be happening. They're there to hold government accountable. They're there to help encourage and enhance transparency. So do you hold government to account by funding opposition? The question of funding opposition, in my view, is um, more of a it's, it's going to be a difficult word to use, but I feel that's more of a propaganda tool. You know, we have all sorts of narratives, these wonderful, fantastic narratives, you know, that the Americans, Germans, British, whoever it is, is in the country and they're opting to sway, you know, the, the politics in the country. I beg to differ as someone who has worked within the NGOs uh, space. The reason why CSOs get into trouble is when they raise valid issues that yes perhaps it might not make the country look good but that's why they are there if there's system if there's systemic corruption taking place and there's an ngo that makes noise about this or prints about this that's their role if government and you know uh, the civic space if you know they sat down and had some sort of understanding you would find that instead of wasting all this time attacking each other over various political narratives, again, it, it drifts into the political sphere, which for me is not the main concern. It's human rights are key in any country. You know, so to label the watchdogs, those who are there to hold you accountable, to automatically label them um, as, you know, terrorist or you know pursuing regime change all of this is wonderful in the field of politics but for organizations that might perhaps be hindered because of that narrative you know because USA has given donor funding they must be pursuing an American agenda you, you can't pursue any of that without the real facts that are on the ground the people were interviewing, the people were talking to, the people that are coming forward. And by the way, they come forward from all political parties. Again, which enhances the importance of NGOs. We are not there for ZANU-PF, we're not there for Triple C, we're not there for MDC. We're there for the people. Our issue is human rights. And again, I always find it's a slippery slope, you know, where we very easily reduce it to the politics. Mm -hmm. of it. Why would we want to cover up human rights abuses or, you, you know, their voice of dissent, they must be getting sponsored. So they're imagining people going through these yeah. violations? I, 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 want to come, I want to come to an interesting point that you raised, uh, uh, Mr. Nguni, when you said that the, the majority of the people who, who were elected um, on, on the MDC ticket were from civic society. Now, I just want to just uh, play the devil's advocate here and spin it a little um, and, and say the majority of people in the past we have seen elected in ZANU PF office are ex members of the army and ex members of the police. So we should close the army and the police. No, there's a really big difference here. And it's important that I, we actually talk about it. Before I even answer you, I, I want to make it very clear. But I'm not speaking for Zanu PF. Sure. I'm not. Mm -hmm. If one people wants to speak, they speak through Christian Trang, but not through me. Okay. I'm speaking my own personal view, which has not been solicited with Zanu PF. It is a fact of life that the Americans and the British say that they are funding NGOs in Zimbabwe to assist in enhancing regime change. And we don't have to, to second guess NGOs. That's what they say. We all know. And I wish everybody was honest. The Americans don't give money for real and genuine democratic values. So, so just, yeah. just, just for clarity there, yeah. uh, uh, our government, Zimbabwean government, mm. has been receiving lots of money from the British and the Americans. So you the government is receiving that money not for any genuine, if I look no, at no, your statement. It's a very big difference. Can I, I want, it's very important. Yes, sir. The people of Zimbabwe chose a government and if an American has got money, wants to give it to the people's government here, they give it to the government. 
But the Americans will never have anybody give money to a party in opposition or a group of people who are opposed to the government. They will not have it. There is the Logan Act that stops all that. And many governments in the world stop that completely. And the truth of the matter here is that the governments of the West themselves are the ones who told us that they are finding uh, uh, that they are funding Triple C, that they are working with the Triple C to achieve regime change. It's a fact. It's not me making up. That's what they said. That the money they are spending here, the data says very clearly, there's seven million US dollars to be given to non-governmental organizations for the enhancement of democracy in Zimbabwe. So it's not us who are saying so. So n this government cannot accept that there are Zimbabweans who can receive money from foreign government to intimidate us into sub supporting a political organization. That is a violation of the fundamental rights of Zimbabweans for us to be forced through sanctions that we must vote for Triple C. An organization that we know, in the unlikely event that we were to come to power, there will be an immediate civil war anyway. So why should we, why should we allow that to happen? We have been told by uh, Triple C themselves that they went to America Shamisa said, I went to Europe to tell them to tighten sanctions on us. Tighten sanctions that ZANU-PF must be moved from power and the people must vote for MDC or Triple C. Why should this government here allow that to continue? They are politicians. The core values of ZANU-PF to remain in power for the principles they believe in. No country in the world can allow no party, no country in the world can allow a party to come to power that is sponsored by foreign hands the way Triple C is. Like I told you, it guarantees that there will be a civil war in the unlikely event MDC was ever to come to power. So why should this government allow to us to be put in a position whereby we are going to, have to fight a civil war because these people are funded by foreigners to achieve regime change? The Americans have said so about regime change. But, but how, where, where will the civil war come The civil war will come in because of the right-wing policies that are, uh, pr that, are, that are being promoted by the Western world. The right-wing policies that are anti-blacks, anti-people, anti-voter, that support voter suppression in Zimbabwe, that are being promoted by the Triple C and, and various other NGOs. They themselves would lead the people of this country into realizing that they would have to fight amongst each other. And we are trying to stop that by making sure that we don't give an opportunity for those civil society organizations to support voter suppression. In this country, there is voter suppression, which is promoted by NGOs and by the Triple C and MDC Alliance, where they want to concentrate the voting in the urban areas and allow the people in the rural areas to move 10 kilometers to a polling station. Whereas in the urban areas, someone goes 20 meters and there's a polling station. That is called voter suppression. In America, the same allegations of voter suppression are the ones that are being said there by Trump that the Democratic Party was involved in voter suppression. In this country, the Triple C is also one is into voter suppression. You have heard some of them saying that uh, we are supported by urban councils who are 80% of the taxpayers. That is voter suppression. So we have a choice. Do we allow people to come into power here by polluting the political space using foreign funding? And then the last question I want to, uh, to, to allow the others a chance to speak is this one. You have heard that there is a problem in um, at ZCT, ZCTU, in the last election of ZCTU. There were allegations against uh, one of the leaders of ZCTU that he received a lot of money from an, a, a union in South Africa that was brought here. And the other people in ZCTU were saying, we don't know what happened to that money. But I want to tell you, it is because the money that came from there was, was from Zid, was Zidera money that was brought to come and fund the activities of Triple C. And you can't expect this government to allow that to continue. To allow that we as Zimbabweans should be forced and pressured by Britain and America and the Western world to vote for a party to stop sanctions so that we vote for Triple C in power. So that we threaten the rights of sovereign rights of Zimbabweans to determine their own future on their own. That's why there's a problem of this nature.
But but you didn't answer my question. Um, my question where I asked you uh, simply that you, you said because a lot of people came from civil society and joined politics, the civil society is now a problem. So I've asked you, a lot of people have come from the army to join ZANU-PF. So is there a problem no, there? But the, exa the example that you are giving, we're not talking about people who have the same agenda. Civil society uh, here was being given money by foreigners to come in here and influence the voting patterns in the rural areas. They've been told, uh, uh, this farm belongs to a white man. Your father was buried here. And if this white man is not here, you are going to lose your jobs. That's what the uh, that's what the MDC stands for. It was against land resettlement program. It was supporting white commercial farmers. That's what uh, that's what happened at that time. Now the difference with soldiers who were in the army. I mean, so soldiers who were just in the army, and they are not they are not in the majority. There are very few soldiers who are members of parliament. That's Guanetza. Who is the other one? I'm trying to see. Well, if you want to talk about war veterans, there's maybe three, they four, five not. other people. But the point here is this, there's a very big difference. The Americans have told us we are funding non-governmental organizations for regime change purposes. They have said so. And they're funding government for what purposes? Uh, to help the people of Zimbabwe. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just the research and me is, is dying. Just mm -hmm. to clarify, the Logan Act, I, I think we've spoken about this before, was created over 222 years ago. Nobody has ever been prosecuted under the Logan Act. Yeah, yeah, that, that's why I'm, I'm just yeah, raising. Yes, this is why I'm, I'm raising the history so we understand. Yeah. The reason why that Logan Act was created is because some Quaker gentlemen went over and, and had negotiations with another country and managed to broker peace, right? And then the government being upset that this other gentleman had gone and brokered peace when they were unable to, got very upset. And they passed the Logan Act specifically for him. Which is why to date, no one has ever been um, uh, prosecuted under that law. It's just there. They have a separate um, act, which is the Patriot Act, which is very different to the provisions of the Logan Act. And I know even in Zimbabwe, we had this whole discussion about we must have a, patri uh, a Patriots Act to stop, again, the notion of uh, uh, not just NGOs, but persons engaging with the international community, aside from the government. My concern, even you know, during this discussion, is the politicization of the legitimate work that is done by civil society organizations. Uh, for me, it's strange because, for example, within the space that I, I've worked in, you know, I, I've worked for one of the biggest NGOs in the country, uh, the Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum, from a personal opinion, all these wonderful stories about, you know, donors will tell you this and they will tell you that, you know, for whatever political reasons. I haven't seen it to date. And, you know, I've been in the field for a very long time, for a decade. So for me, again, it comes back to the notion that we're now taking politics and, and you know, having our narratives, our propaganda, whatever it is, and bringing it into a position to interfere with the legitimate work of NGOs. Again, we say the PVO bill is, a, is based on the FATF recommendation eight. Even here in our discussion, that's not the concern. We're not worried about money laundering or terrorist financing. The entire conversation is based on politics. You know, this party or whatever is viewed as having a foreign agenda. Why did these people who work for NGOs do this, that, and the other? And again, I feel that's politicking with real human rights violation issues. And I'll speak just in that regard particularly. If something happens within the country, say uh, human rights violations have been perpetrated by the government itself, and the only person who can report or raise alarm over what's happening is the government, you know, it speaks to the point you were mentioning. Why would the government sit and wait for somebody to attack them? You know, it's, it's for me, it just it doesn't make sense um, that any person who speaks against real issues is automatically seen as an enemy of state.
a puppet of the West. I will, I will allow you. I will, I will allow you. You know, a puppet of the West, or and then also, you know, we raised the issue where you had said, you know, the um, the Americans said that we're here to push regime change. I thought it was to enhance democracy, and much the same with NGOs. We're there to enhance democracy by being the watchdog to hold the government accountable. Now, the government might not necessarily like it when someone within, you know, that space is being called out for something. It's understandable. We're human. Nobody wants that. But at the end of the day, the bigger concern for me is when there's real attacks, when people are being abducted, when women are being raped, when, you know, there's over 350,000 cases of assault, politically motivated violence. That's a concern. So for me, that's when I say I find it very difficult to come into the politicking of this when we're not paying enough attention to the actual violations taking place in the country and holding whoever is responsible, be it government, be it CC, whoever it is, holding them accountable. That should be where the focus is, not keeping power and protecting myself from anyone who raises issue with me. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where I take I need, issue. I need to say something here. Okay. I opened up earlier on by saying that not all NGOs are bad. But who decides which ones are bad? Just, just, just hold on. Let me, let me explain. The government is not opposed to NGOs that help the people. You understand that? They are not. But those NGOs that receive money, is their money. When the Americans have said that money is for regime change purposes, you can't expect the government to support those activities. I don't know if I'm making myself very clear. Those that receive their money, and the Americans have told us that they are paying NGOs here for regime change. You can't expect ZANU-PF to support the activities of those NGOs. Yeah, but what I, find, what I find very peculiar is that when the money comes from America and is given to the ZANU-PF government is to help the people, if the money comes from the same source and is given to other people, it is to it destroy ZANU-PF. I, I, don't, I don't... I want yeah, you to explain that. I want to explain that. Because yes. It's very important. Yes. The example that you are giving is not really correct and good. The people, who, the people who the people of Zimbabwe have chosen to run this country on their behalf is ZANU-PF right now. So the one the people who control this budget of, for, for this country is ZANU-PF. So if anybody wants to give money here, the money doesn't, it doesn't, the benefit doesn't go to ZANU-PF members. It goes to all members, including members of Triple C and, and non-aligned people. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you give money to Zimbabweans, to finance them to say, go and influence people to support your party so that you can bring back white commercial farmers uh, who have been, whose land has been taken away by ZANU PF. You cannot expect ZANU PF to accept that. No, I, I agree with Just you. Just like every government what, in the world cannot what, what accept I'm that. What I'm asking, what yeah. I'm asking. Do you ever see the difference? Yes, Mr. Nguni, what I'm asking is this is that why wouldn't you just say because the Americans shouldn't give Zimbabwe money? All right, okay. Let, 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 me say this yeah. for, let me say this for the last time. Mm -hmm. I want to know, do you agree that the Zidera gives money $7 million for people who are pushing regime change in Zimbabwe? The Americans say so. Do you agree? That the, the, that's what the Americans say. Do you agree that the Americans pay people in this country, different people, for regime change purposes, directly for regime change? Do you agree? They've, or, they've, they've openly refused that. They've openly refused that narrative. I don't speak on the uh, on behalf of, of, of the U.S. government, but my question to you, my question to you was just simple. If you say this person is bad, this particular person is bad, they're a thief, their money is blood money, right? Why don't you just say Zimbabweans, no matter whether it's government, whether it's NGOs, let's not take the American money, because it is blood money, because they are against our national interest. But that is my question. You have read this data. Uh, can you answer that question? I'm going to answer that yes. question. You have read this data. Mm -hmm. It says very specifically, there's seven million dollars to pay for civil society organizations to enhance democracy. That's what they say. Yes, yes. yes. Demo that's what they say. Yes. But they're democracy. So, so are you saying to just, 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 just democracy is to remove them? No, no, no. They also say that. They talk every day about that they must remove this government. It's illegitimate. They say that every day. But isn't that hearsay? No, no, the, the American government says so. Where? Because my understanding is if it says the enhancement of democracy, it's not explicitly say that that's now a matter of interpretation, right? That enhancement of democracy equals 
pushing a regime change no, it's agenda. The, the yes. They said directly. Where? The, because I haven't. Times. Where? That they Give me an example. Where? They, they, that they will not engage with the, with the Zimbabwean government. They will not talk to the Zimbabwean government because there's, there's human rights abuses in this country. There's no democracy in this country. They've said you say, so. Would you say that's false? That there's but, human rights. Okay, Mr. But, but, but I must also tell you that the Americans saying so. There are many countries that the Americans uh, talk to around the world where there's no democracy at all. There's not even an election in Saudi Arabia. There's not even an election in Bahrain, in Abu Dhabi. There are people being executed and being killed there. The Americans don't pass specific acts to punish those people. But in the case of Zimbabwe, the Americans say uh, because there's no democracy here, according to them, they passed an, a specific act in Congress. I, I, now, I, the reason I, I, I want to agree with I, you. I, I, I want to agree with what no, you say. No, let me, I, I'm, I'm, let yeah, me I'll, finish. I'll this. allow you to speak. Yeah. But I'm agreeing with what you say. Yeah. That 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 um, the American uh, foreign foreign policy has been somewhat selective. But and, and you you know and we know that we have been put under sanctions mm. as Zimbabwe for those things that are probably happening in other countries. But I'm, my question to you that you have not answered. Is that knowing all that, why is government continuing I to receive money okay. from that enemy of it? The government it has, it has never received direct money from the American government. That is not true. No, no. They've, they've funded certain projects, do you understand? But not money. They, they are, do you know the reason why they can't do that? This data doesn't allow them to do that. They, they are, they, they, they just specifically excludes that no American citizen will give any money or grant in the IMF or World Bank to any representative of the Zimbabwean government. They fund projects. And we have seen recently USAID going to the rural areas and attempting to make people believe there is another rural development program which can be done just better than the ZANU PF1. That is already political. The issue here is that no country, no government in the world can ever accept that their own private citizens can be funded to mobilize around an agenda of foreign powers. That is the reason why we have to put a stop in. And I've told you that I'm against this POV or bill. I am not supporting it. And the reason why I'm not supporting it is that it doesn't go far enough. It is a liberal one. For example, the government is saying because of financial task team, that is nonsense. They must be honest and say to, to us, because the, there are agents of imperialism that are in the country, that to stop those agents of imperialism like Triple C and various other people, we are putting this thing, it's much more honest and much better. But I'm not a member of government, and I must speak on behalf of government. My personal view is that we must, by an appointed date, stop the activities of all organizations that we think are advocacy groups for regime change and allow those organizations that are here to help the people of Zimbabwe to operate without any hindrance. Can I come in? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, want to, I want you to come in, but I just want to read uh, this um, uh, part of the, uh, of the public consultations on the private voluntary organization amendment bill that was read uh, on the fourth session of the ninth parliament in May 2022. And on five two of it, it says that criminalizing the involvement of PVOs in politics is meant to remind them of their core mandate. That is for developmental purposes rather than to support or oppose political parties or candidates or finance a political party or candidate. This is, this is uh, one of the objectives or issues that have been put there. But you can... Okay, I, I'll start by responding to that. Actually, when they say their core mandate is developmental, then the bill itself, the way it is crafted, it shows also short-sightedness on the part of the crafters in the sense that... Uh, they look at development only in uh, social and economic. But we also have to, uh, to f move towards uh, comprehensive uh, you know, development. Development is not faceted. It actually includes even political development. We should be able to resolve this thing through national dialogue. And the, um, the, the, the political parties that are being mentioned, like Triple C, we have had uh, the president of Triple C, uh, President Nelson Chamisa, calling for genuine national dialogue, which will actually resolve these other problems. This is not the only problem in Zimbabwe. We have the problem of violence. I myself, in 2000, I witnessed people being 
uh, you know, beaten by ZANPF, the, the so-called Jambanja. I saw it. That's when I made a decision that I have to be in parliament one day to fight ZANPF. And today I was informed by the, you know, recklessness of ZANPF to unleash uh, people and soldiers to beat its own people. My father, at 74 years of his age, he was taken to Garemwera Township and they wanted to beat him until those people said, no, we can't beat this Mdara. This is when they washed their hands. They ended up saying, endakuna ui, endakuna ui. But Mdara Wangu was almost beaten by ZANPF. My, his young brother, she got, was actually taken. And we know the family that took that goat. So the, when he was talking about, uh, you know, uh, civil war, the people at some point, we have to go to that family and reclaim our goat. We have to, we will not fight, we will not take axes or spears. We will just go to court to say this family, this and this, took our goat and we want to reclaim it through the court of law. Because uh, I, for example, I represent a democratic party. I, I, I don't belong to a terrorist organization. The, so that's another thing whereby ZANPF will then label those who challenge them as terrorists. I will give you an example that uh, he said th there is no problem when the military guys join uh, ZEC, when they join, uh, they join yeah. even civil society. They, he, he doesn't see any problem. There are a lot of them in parliament, not only in parliament. It's very soon we are going to have a presidium dominated by the army. The Second Republic it was actually a regime change, which was uh, instigated by the army, the KG6. You know, the Mugagao declaration is still influencing. And can you allow me to just give you a background of why now the military is now involved in the, in, in the affairs of governance in Zimbabwe? They were introduced, you know, to, 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 to the resources of this country through the land reform. When they were introduced to the land reform, they went to DRC. They were introduced again to quick money uh, from the mines. When they came back, this is when they, were, they coincided with uh, the, 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 the discovery of diamonds in Chiazwa. Then the army were involved. So when you see the army now in the governance, they are not for the people. They are for protection of their national, of their own personal interest, not for the national interest. If they are for the national interest, where is diamond money? It is unheard of to see a country that discovers diamonds to go for three months in poverty, like what we are doing in Zimbabwe. There is no situation where if the army is real for the people, how can the Pomona deal continue? To get even support from the people, the NGOs, he is here, the president of NGOs, a, a forum of NGOs. What are they saying about Pomona deal? They are mum about the Pomona deal, but now city of Harare, it is alleged that it was handed over. 750,000 debt. Why city of Harare should be allowed to pay uh, a, a, the, that new company for them to actually offload their waste? They are giving that company raw materials. It is the company that is supposed to be actually paying city of Harare. So this is the role of the NGOs. And when they question that, then they call it political. They are supposed to question that this deal is not good for the people. In Warren Park, for example, the, the council is extracting you know, gravel. And we have lost two precious lives. One uh, kid 11 years, another one 16 years old. They died when, when this extraction of uh, gravel, they left the deep gullies and water accumulated. They were swimming. They died. And Emma failed to even issue a statement to say we are sorry for the people of Warren Park, for the people of Zimbabwe. The NGOs are there. They are doing nothing. So this is where we are saying we need the free operation of NGOs to be able to hold the government accountable to say the deals that we are doing, uh, they are not good for the people. I know even at UN level, at AU level, civil society organizations have been given consultative status. We should be seeing the government crafting a bill that gives NGOs, civil society organizations, a consultative status to say before we issue a law in terms of marriage, we are going to ask 
civil societies that specializes with the girl child to give their own opinion. They should be given a consultative status, not that their activities criminalized because there is someone who fear to be removed from power. They should know that we have a new constitution, 2018 constitution. If implemented, it allows every Zimbabwean to contest for the highest office. We are now seeing uh, the allegation that the, uh, the, uh, the, the commander Valerius Banda will be the next VP. What does it mean to Zimbabwe? The NGOs should speak out. This is the full-fledged militarization of the state. So I don't even see the talked about 7 million. If we say 7 million, if we assume a t-shirt goes for a dollar, how many t-shirts are we going to get from 7 million? Can 7 million really bring regime change? Are we that dump that Zimbabweans can exceed regime change through just $7 million? What is the budget of ZANPF for what was the budget for ZANPF in 2018 election? Can you really say we fear $7 million, uh, because it will then cause regime change? I, I, I don't believe so. Can we say our rural people are dumb that they, if they are given money, they will, they will then vote for, for, for Triple C? They will vote for Triple C because they have seen that uh, the current government has failed. The current government is busy coming up with laws that criminalizes the people, the laws that stifle the freedom of association of the people, the, a, a regime that actually uh, abducts its own people, a regime that doesn't care about the rights of the people, a regime that doesn't even care about the poverty. You see, we have a lot of challenges that we are facing as a country. There's no solution in sight. Um, we'll just uh, get uh, back to you just after this short break. This is the situation right now in proud partnership with Cotrad in Mashingo, and we are discussing the PVO bill, and things are getting heated. Welcome back to this amazing discussion on the PVO bill proudly brought to you in proud partnership with HSTV and Cotrad from Mashingo. And we're talking about the PVO bill and its effects. Now, I want to come to the effects of the PVO bill. Um, now, on, on uh, what has been uh, recommended by the Committee of Parliament was that they be the cancellation of a certificate or a license of any PVO that deliberately fails to stick to its mandate or participate in politics. Now, Yasin. Yes. Um, I, I just want, this is section 62 of the, but read um, uh, together, I'm, I'm being learned, read, <laughs> read together with 5.2. Um, 5.2 says that uh, PVOs, they, they are for developmental purposes, yes. right? Yes. Uh, and here it says that, six, section 62 says, they be a cancellation of certificate or a license of PVOs that stray from their mandate. How do you, I, I just want to understand, how do you advocate and, and push for development without being political? This is my question, and it's what I mentioned earlier. That's a very broad term. So it would have been preferable, for example, if this was a legitimate point, to then qualify that and say NGOs who are found to be doing one, two, three, four shall be guilty of an offense. The fact that we're using such vague, broad, sweeping terminology is where the concern is because, you know, as we can see, you know, there's a lot of political beliefs and opinions and all of this going around, which, which makes it difficult then to, to ignore the fact that this is just clearly... Uh, a bill to politicize the work of perceived voices of dissent. Um, and it's, you might find that there's NGOs, for example, um, with close ties or a friendly relationship or who are seen to be non-problematic by the government. I'm pretty sure those will be fine. And perhaps those are the good NGOs. But anyone who's raising, and, and again, I speak from experience, anyone who's raising legitimate issues, you know, be it corruption. For example, um, there's a systemic problem of corruption in this country. Yes? If an NGO then speaks on it, it could very easily be considered political. 
without that qualification of, of what that means. It, it simply stands as a weapon to silence those who you don't like or who you don't like what they're saying. And that's contrary to democracy. You, you know, you might not like it. You know, it might embarrass you. You're embarrassed because one of your ministers stole 15 billion dollars. Of course, it's embarrassing. Nobody likes that. But you then can't fault the voices or the organizations or whoever it is who brings these things to light. That is the purpose of a democratic society. You should be able to speak. You should be able to raise um, alarm over things that are happening. And again, it's not just with, and I'll keep repeating this, it's not just with ZANU-PF or MDC or Triple C or NAG or whatever it is. Any person who is contrary to the value system or the democratic system of Zimbabwe, as far as I'm concerned, has a case to answer to. Politics has no role in that, particularly for NGOs. It shouldn't be an issue. And government as well shouldn't see that as an attack on the entire government. We're helping government. We're helping you weed out the weasels within your camp. Mm. So, you know, it's, I don't think it should be this hostile, contentious sort of I mean, thing. I mean, now, now we, we actually have run out of time, but I want us to, um, I want to give my panelists here an opportunity to have a closing arguments uh, on this bill. But um, um, here, uh, I, I, I read uh, section six, uh, six two of, of this uh, document that was read in Parliament, and the, I just wanted to, un to understand from you uh, an opportunity for you as you do your closing uh, arguments that the cancellation of certificate or license of PVO that deliberately fails to stick to, uh, to its mandate or participate in politics. What effect does this have on freedom of speech and freedom of association and work by the people? You know, it actually means that um, uh, it will have a very good effect on those bogus non-governmental uh, non organizations those bogus non-governmental organizations, those non-governmental organizations that receive money to tell lies about their own country. They will be in trouble. Their licenses will be cancelled. Those that do work for the people of this country, they will not be cancelled. And any organization that exposes corruption, there's nothing wrong with that. There are many ministers who are arrested. We are against corruption as well. But is it not uh, but, uh, just, just hold on, hold on. If they do that, they, we, there's no problem from us. But an organization that gives $20 to people in urban areas called care. And the, 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 the way the money is given to the people and the way the people are chosen are through NDC councillors, amounts to direct vote buying. And if those that care decides to transfer, transfer the $20 they're giving to people away from the urban areas on the basis they don't have enough money, they now want to pay $20 a month, uh, a month to uh, households. That is amounts to a serious politicking to get the rule of voters to support Triple C. Now, those organizations, they will have a problem in this country. They will have a problem because we, as ZANU-PF, have a mandate to run this country and make laws in this country. Now, I know that the MDC considers this government illegitimate. Even though they were the one in election, yes, it is. And, and, yeah, it is illegitimate. Yeah, but they still want a government that is illegitimate to 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 dialogue with them and to make changes to the body politic and the legal framework in this country. A government they think is illegitimate. Now, I want to finalize this thing by saying that we do have a problem in this country, and the biggest problem that we have is uh, people that are called members of the triple c and the reason why they are a danger to this country is this you just heard him saying that zanupia is illegitimate he they're telling us that in the unlikely event shamisa wins the next elections zanupia members must say he's illegitimate and we are going to fight him like what shamisa is doing now now i want to ask whether that promotes democratic values amazing in your closing remarks Okay, in my closing remarks, I would say all this what we are debating is because of the tox 
toxic politics in, in, in Zimbabwe. We can comment, uh, we can have millions of comments on this bill. It is a bad bill uh, together with other laws that have been passed in parliament and that are also coming in that are actually um, aimed in entrenching power to, to the current regime. There is no problem in having uh, uh, power changing hands. But what is, what is important is that uh, the, the le legitimate issue which uh, Mr. Nguni has just spoke about, it was clear even Zeke doesn't know the results of uh, the presidential results of 2018. In Mount Darwin, we heard that uh, um, around 5.30, they said 105,000 people had voted. But later on, more than 300,000 had voted uh, an, an hour later. So you will find that even Zeke doesn't know we have a, a member of parliament who have lost uh, in Chegutu, but he's still in parliament today. So those are the things that then builds up to the concept of legitimate and illegitimate. So this is, these are the things that needs to be resolved in Zimbabwe. The issues that needs to be cured is the politics uh, in Zimbabwe. Once this politics is cured, when and it can... It's now five years. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah, it, because... It, Next it, year, title of the band. <laughs> it, it, it remains, it, it, it remains yeah. illegitimate, but the, the cure to illegitimate would say, yes, you have managed to manipulate the systems, but now is a way forward. Can you then sit down? Can we come and reason together? How, how best can we resolve our country? How best can we move Zimbabwe forward? It can only be done through dialogue. A dialogue which brings all the people together. You, you heard uh, General Chiwenga, the, the Vice President, saying we are all stockholders uh, of this country, meaning that even the military, they are also stockholders. They also want a cake. And he was mentioning just the General Guanetta. There are a lot more of generals yeah, in, in parliament and also in four. diplomatic missions. There are a number of them. So my, my, my concluding remarks is that uh, rather than spending uh, money, because we are going to spend also money uh, starting to amend again these bad laws, it is important that Zimbabwe focuses on bringing all interested parties together, even their own president, Idi Nangagwa, he, he realized that the only way to resolve this country was through dialogue, though he instituted uh, another bad way of bringing the Poland. Uh, but uh, it, it, it then gives a signal that what the solution that is needed in Zimbabwe is a genuine national dialogue. I thank you. Amazing. Um, um, I think for me, um, I would like to encourage or hope that we can take politicking out of legitimate issues or legitimate democratic issues that affect regular citizens on the street. Not on a political level of who's right, who's in power. I would like for us to at least not interfere with structures which are engaging in legitimate democratic development in the country. Um, if there's an issue with PVOs not being registered or regulated, I know most CSOs have called for self-regulation and we have other bodies in the country that self-regulate. So that could be an alternative. The concern with the PVO uh, amendment bill is it's very clearly a political tool. This has nothing to do with, you know, uh, actual uh, violations or things on the ground. This is strictly for politics. And for me, that, that's a shame because we marginalize, we demean, we make small the real issues that are happening to the people on the ground. So for me, simply on that basis alone, um, I would call for the disbandment, you know, the tossing away of this particular bill. Amazing. Now, thank you very much um, to my wonderful panelists for this amazing uh, discussion. Now, uh, the late Alex Magaisa, academic, um, sober giant, uh, I, I used to love to say he was peacefully violent uh, <laughs> when he used this word. He, um, he once said that Zimbabwe is over-regulated. The government appears to craft a law on anything 
that they might not want. Just in perspective, in the past, I think, two years, we have had over 400 statutory instruments that have been issued in this country. 400 in the past two years. The law is for the people and not the people for the law. We must find each other as Zimbabweans. We must allow each other to participate in the spaces of politics because politics is who gets what, when, and how. And that is basically the definition of development. So if we remove politics from development, we have no development. This was, this is the situation right now in proud partnership with Kotrat from Mashingo, Heart and Soul TV and Radio. And on closing, we would just want to say, Alex Magaisa, rest in peace, my friend. Rest in peace, my brother. You were a constitutional law expert. You took time to contribute to the development of this nation. You never had time to say no when it came to discussing law and peace in Zimbabwe. Rest in power, Alex Magaisa. We love you. Thank you very much. Thank you.